Greetings and salutations to all you folks out there. So I've got a new map for you. Let me get my tongue untied real quick right before I start this cast. All right, we've never seen this one before. The map is called Dark Fall, and it does look really interesting. It's a three versus three map, very close quarters with not a whole lot of reclaim to draw on. There's a large clump here with a high mass value and a couple clumps along the outside edges. But for the most part, this is low mass extractor count, close quarters, land warfare. And that should make for a pretty action-packed game. Without further ado, let's go ahead and introduce the players, then we'll jump directly in the game. Um, on the right hand team, this is not going to be north versus south. Right hand, we've got Raptor Jesus taking Cybern faction, Nanotech Cybern as well, and Belated Cube. It looks like this is the Cybern team. And then on the left, we've got Aeon. Was this preset? I bet this was preset. This is Aeon versus Cybern matchup. So once and for all, we will decide which one of these guys is the stronger faction. And it does look like we've got roughly balanced game two, a roughly balanced game. We've got 500 versus 400. Then we've got 14 in the back and 15 in the back. And then we've got 13 versus 12. So yeah, that's like 96% game quality there. Cannot ask for anything more than that. So we've got land factories going down for all six players. And then we'll just have to see where they spread out from here. One other thing I do need to mention, um, once again, no uh, map screen. Wow, that's an odd texture split right there. Um, there is no mini map on the side because I am still trying to sort out all of my settings and it is being a nightmare. I'm probably going to end up moving to a different recording software. Right now I'm using a combination of Shadowplay and OBS and I may end up trying to get uh, DX3 or something like that. Anywho, we've got two engineers out first for Raptor Jesus picking up some manual reclaim and a couple of mass extractors on the outlying edges belated cube rushing for an early hydro. He did build a power generator first, so he's not going to get as close to stalling as you typically do if you only rush the hydro. But as we all know, if you have a hydro very close to your spawn, you have enough in your storage to build land factory, four mass extractors, three engineers, and a hydro before you stall. It will just be a little bit slow on the uptick once your hydro comes online because it will be almost completely stalled. Not completely stalled, but just about. On the left side, it looks like we got a little bit more of an aggressive approach. We have two tanks out early. Aurora's paired with a land scout, the all-important, oh-so-critical land scout for T1 Aeon armies uh, you just cannot do without it you literally cannot do and then uh, we've got one scout and a couple of mantis coming out for raptor jesus 400 rank player is taking care of himself reasonably well throwing down a second land factory on maybe too little income he does need to pick up some of this manual reclaim that would help him out a ton you live and you learn hard mass stall there you go well that is the only way that you can get better Nanotech has got his mass extractors down and his factory built, and he is producing Mantis. But, yeah, there we go. A little bit of movement. We got to get the ACU either to the front line or building something because you don't want your ACU to be idle, especially in the early part of the game. It is the most powerful unit, both in engineering and in combat. It has the highest hit point value, so you need to get it in the action ASAP. Hush, throwing down a multitude of land factories, or at least he's planning to, along with a lot of power. That is probably an overbuild of power, but he may be going for... He may be going for ACU upgrades. That would make sense, and that would be why he needed that many power generators. Gently throwing some air units up. ASAP. He's got a bomber out. He's got a scout, and Belated Cube is matching him step for step, if a couple of seconds behind. That bomber is immediately going to head for Raptor. Always want to try to snag some early engineers with those bombers. Um, the going value is two engineers. If you kill two engineers, the bomber was worth it. But it looks like this one will not get the kills. Got an interceptor on it ASAP. Beautiful little hover bomb right there. But, ah, he did get it. One bomb. Not quite worth it, but wasn't a complete and total fail. And it looks like Belated Cube is going to be able to bomb a little bit more. But not too much longer because we do have an interceptor here now it looks like because of the terrain 
Yes, all of these plateaus are cut off. So you're going to be able to get engineers up here, but you're not going to be able to build these two mass extractors unless you actually pick up an engineer and drop it there, because there's not room to edge build a factory. There may be room to edge build a factory there, but these two plateaus are also separated and not accessible from the ground. And then you've got this one right here. So kind of a convoluted landscape, and it does look like it is symmetrical on the diagonal this way. All right. Everything is shaping up quite nicely. I do like the looks of this map. It has kind of a dedicated support player. Um, that is six, seven mass extractors, which is not a lot. It does force expansion. Not quite as bad as Twin Rivers, but it does force you to get out and get some mass extractor points, which Belated is doing right here, but we have interceptors trying to pick up the transport. Gently just does not have enough air. That's all there is to it. He's got an early T2 mass extractor, and he's upgrading a second one. And it looks like we're upgrading two at once for Belated Cube. Apparently, he bit into some reclaim somewhere or has some mass on his plate to use up. And yes, he does. There's reclaim for you, filling up that mass bar. 1,000 in the bank so far, gently with about the same. But I think Gently was assisting his Mass Extractor upgrade to get them online quicker as opposed to Belated Cube just upgrading two at once. Um, there's a lot of math that goes into the return on that, but essentially what it comes down to is if you have a limited amount of mass, it is better to upgrade one Mass Extractor completely than to upgrade two Mass Extractors halfway because the upgraded Mass Extractor starts earning the investment back sooner. So it is actually better to assist one than build two at once. But, you know, if you have the steady mass income to upgrade two at once, then why not do it? We've got Belated Cube. He said he forgot to spam power, which it may look like he has plenty of power, but when you're running two air factories, the hydro and that many PGENs is not going to be enough if you try to throw down an upgrade. So he is trying to throw down some uh, power generators along the back here. We've got two sections of them going so that he'll be able to make the T2 air transition without just completely and totally stalling out. And then we do have another transport rushing up here to try and build. Gently already has engineers down, but he does not have his factory up yet. If you can get that factory online, the tanks will come, and it will be easy as pie to get this thing locked down. He's going to go ahead and snatch up that reclaim, which is a good thing. If you can get the reclaim, then that will give you the resources to build other things for later. And paused engineer, that is probably eco manager mod, and I think it screwed him over. Because that engineer pause means that the factory is not going to get done. Oh, it did. Yes. But now the engineers are going to reclaim the factory. So it's all a matter of whether or not anything useful can be built out of that to save the factory. There is going to be a tank, but it's not going to be able to kill the engineers fast enough to actually do anything good. There's the reclaim dodging around, and he will be able to eliminate the engineers. So... Nicely done there. <laughs> Beautiful. Wall sections being built, trying to stop the firing of that tank, but it's firing through the crack right there, hitting the point defense now. I don't think those engineers are going to win, but it was a valiant effort. Belated Cube has abandoned his rear position, and he is rushing up to the front to give a hand to Raptor Jesus. Raptor Jesus does have the gun upgrade, shooting his partner in the back, but I guess that can be dismissed. The gun upgrade is the best possible thing that you can have versus Swarms of Auroras because it takes away the range advantage. So Raptor Jesus is going to be able to easily, oh so easily, beat back those hordes of T1 tanks, and then with the combined firepower of Belated and Raptor, this is a dangerous, dangerous situation. Nihilus is doing a bit better, actually. He does have all of his mass extractors claimed now. He's up to 17 mass per tick, which is the lowest, but it's, it's still respectable. Oh, no, that is Nanotech. Nanotech has the lowest. Shame on me for getting that confused. Nellis has... 23 mass income and is in the red, but he has storage, so he's not stalled. Looks like he is managing himself reasonably well. My advice to him would be to get a good starting build order, because everything looks fine and dandy now, but when you get behind in the first minute or two of the game, it's really hard to catch back up. That initial build order, absolutely critical. In this situation where you don't have immediate access to a hydropower plant, yeah, you don't. Only the air player does. Okay. I would recommend factory, mass extractor, two power generators, mass extractor, mass extractor, and then either 
a lot of power generators or maybe one or two and then the fourth mass extractor and immediately send your first engineer to grab some reclaim that will help you out tremendously corsair coming in sniping off that mass extractor and uh that was that a radar maybe a radar and a power generator something like that corsair did some damage hush has double gun upgrade that is going to go very nicely against Raptor Jesus and Belated Cube, who is also throwing down the gun upgrade. This is going to be two gun comms versus one. I think we're about to see a death because I don't see any way that Hush is going to be able to come out of this alive. Yes, he does have both of his gun upgrades, but both of his opponents do as well. And here come the Mantis. We have three ACUs versus one if they all just get in range. T1 bombers coming in. Probably some more Corsairs if I... It would not surprise me. I don't see them building at the moment, though. Is that... That is a gunship. That is a T2 gunship. All right. ACUs backing off of each other and going for upgrades. Why... Did Belated Cube quit his upgrade? That makes absolutely no sense. He has his upgrade. Okay, so he's probably getting stealth. Yes. Stealth and stealth. So these guys are going for maximum aggressive commander. And Nanotech and Nihilus are just kind of hanging out in the bottom edge. Kaboom! Too many units. Far, far too many units for that ACU to handle. So much T1 spam descending upon that commander. And that is that. We now have a dead comm on the southern side. It is sad to see him go, but we can all see why he did. Hopefully he learns from it and he sees this cast, and hopefully he can, you know, do do better the next time. That If you can do better every time you play, it doesn't matter if you lose or not, as long as you learn something. That is the most critical thing. Hush is now under fire from T2 gunships. The glorious might of the Swift Wind is coming in to try to save him, but alas, one Swift Wind is no match for 20-plus interceptors. I know that they're tier 2, and these are only tier 1 units, but tier 1 actually have higher damage per mass concentrations than most higher tiered units do. So, little tidbit of information there for you. The only disadvantage of the interceptors are the speed and the turning rate. Uh, swift winds can run in circles around interceptors, so once you get enough of a little clump to get behind them, then it's game over. Alright, Hush is kiting out with that superior range, massive range on the Aeon Double Comp. And he's going to try to eliminate as many, of the, as many of these tanks as he possibly can before they come into firing range. He's doing a pretty good job of that, but horrendous horde of Mantis. This is the peak of Cybern power right here. The Mantis rush is so brutal, especially when there's Medusas mixed into it. We've got a couple here and there. There's one and two and three. Yeah, he's building some. Enough, I suppose. Pair that with two gun commanders, and you have a recipe for disaster. He's trying to get an oblivion turret online, but honestly, would be better off building T1 point defense because the T1 point defense comes online faster, has higher DPS, and a higher firing rate, so it does better versus T1 units. Granted, there are enough T1 artillery where it would screw over a point defense no matter what tech it is, but it's better to have the DPS actually online than the long build time of the T2 point defense when they're going to be overrunning your position anyway. The only r advantage of the T2 point defense is the range. And there goes Hush in a blaze of nuclear fire taking out, wow, took out the entire interceptor swarm. Well, there with the air advantage. All Gently has to do now is build a handful of Swift Winds, and he can win total air control with basically no effort. Now, there's a lot of Corsairs on the field, but yeah. Well, I don't know. Hold on. We have a T2 shield. We have no flak. We have no... Only have two anti-air turrets and two Swift Winds. Building T1 bombers at the moment. He really needs to build more Swift Winds because here come the Corsairs for the final strike. This could actually be way shorter of a game than I planned on. Uh, he's also getting an upgrade out in the open. That's interesting. There's the Corsair. Headed straight for the ACU. Hopefully all of these do an immediate roundabout and head for that ACU because they need to eliminate him ASAP. He actually has resource allocation. I just noticed that. Why did he get resource allocation? Well, I suppose 
now that he has it, he will be able to take T3 air at any time he wishes, and he will be able to survive having his power generator sniped, which with this many Corsairs on the field is a real concern. Interesting note, 1.4k power off of T1 power generators. That is a beautiful thing, my friends. Always awesome to see how high some people can get. Oh my word, there went half the health on that ACU in one shot, but he did finish the upgrade. So that means he has T2 on the commander. He'll be able to throw down point defense very, very quickly. The two T1 anti-airs and those couple of swift winds falling in behind the Corsairs were able to eliminate them very, very quickly. So the air threat is gone, but the land th threat is real. We've got two T1 point defense back here. Gently pushing on towards the front. He has no gun upgrades whatsoever, only RAS and T2. Throwing down a T1 point defense. Again, this is the wiser choice. When you have units that are already on top of your position, T1 point defense fares far better than a T2. Lots and lots of tasty reclaim to be had. Looks like he's going to push a T3 upgrade, build a Oblivion, and Oblivion, pardon my terrible English, in the back here that will be able to fire downwards. Now, we're probably going to have some terrain issues right there. Ah, stupid map. Yep, you saw it hit. Some terrain issues are to be had when you have a ledge like that, but that will provide a little bit of advanced range out this way. Um, T3 Air Factory coming online, T1 Bombers coming out of that until he started the T2 upgrade. Looks like he's going to go for some more Swift Winds out of that one. Yeah, very, very low on build power. This is what worries me more than anything. Gently has, by far, the biggest eco, almost doubling the next highest, which is Belated Cube. However, he has no build power. He has a T2 ACU, he has two factories, and a literal handful of engineers. Well, I don't know about literal handful. Figurative handful, because I doubt I could actually pick up one of things, these things, judging by the scale of Supreme Commander. So right now, his uh, bottleneck is going to be build power, although he is using all of his mass when his ACU bites in. So I think he's going to be okay. I spy air. There's the Corsairs. Expert little circle dodge, and all of the Corsairs miss. Beautiful, beautiful thing. Comments over here. Go for the power. Well, yes, actually, because when the ACU is aware of your presence and he's actively dodging, bombers don't do so well. So aiming for stationary objects does you a lot more good. He also needs to build. Ah, there you go. He did build a flag. Good job, Belated Cube. Good job, preemptively fulfilling my request. Unless I missed that earlier and he actually did have a flak and that's what took down all those other Corsairs so fast. That actually wouldn't surprise me. I may just not be, I may just not be observant enough at this point. So in the back here, we're seeing a lot of development of the bases. Raptor Jesus has a ton of land factories down. Looks like we do have a engineers from Belated Cube chomping down on this mass up front. Gently dodging and weaving around the artillery shots that are coming in. 100% Medusa fire because it is 100% cyber and Belated Cube is moving up with his Rambo Com. And there it is. Restorer. Only six interceptors on the field. That is not going to be enough. And there's only a handful of T1 anti-air at the front. That tanky son of a gun is going to be able to just take the shots. 6,000 health on it. And he is going to be vetting up quickly on all these T1 units. Already has one vet in the bag, up to 6,600 health potential with five real. And here comes the second restorer. That ACU is only at 6,000 health, but he's got two restorers and a whole lot of point defense on hand to defend himself with. Belated Cube is actually in a bad position here. He's walking into point defense fire. He's going to go below 75% health. He should have been running a long time ago, and hopefully somebody... There we go, T3 mobile anti-air. Somebody needs to be building flak by the buttload because restorers... The only way to take care of mass restorers is to... Build mobile flak. That is the only way. T1 just does not cut it. And T3, the firing cycle's too slow. Here come the Corsairs for another round. 
Once again, the ACU taking the shots in the face, dipping below 3,000 health with the combined fire there of those artillery. But there goes the ACU belated cube. The powerhouse of this team is now done for. Gently, luckily, is down to 59 eco. All of this was wiped out by that artillery and the T1 units coming up through here. So that's the good news. The good news is that he doesn't have 100 plus income. The bad news is, is that he's sitting on the mother load of all reclaim piles. Well, ACU nuke took out some of this over here. He does still have a ton of reclaim in here. And he has T3 air, which the other team really doesn't have an answer to at this point. Now what he should be doing is scouting. Because we have a lonely, lonely ACU walking back towards his base right here. That is easy pickings. And then there would only be Raptor Jesus. But, uh... Yeah, not going to happen. Here comes the mobile flak, though. Raptor is doing the correct thing. Unfortunately, those tanky bastards are going to survive it somewhat. There goes one restore, thanks to these four T1 anti-air. But the area of effect damage is so lacking in those. The DPS is higher. The area of effect is not existent. They do not have one. So, yeah, that's the main advantage of flak. If you look at the actual damage values on mobile flak, the damage itself is not that super high. What's high is the fact that it has like four or five area of effect, so it's hitting 10 air units at a time, and that compounds the damage. If it's only doing 50 damage, but it's hitting 10 air units, that's effectively 500 damage. Whereas, if you have 50 DPS on flak and 60, I'm pulling numbers out of, out of thin air here. This is not the real value, so don't listen to this too hard. But if you have 50 from one source and 60 from another, even though the DPS is higher on these, it's only hitting one target at a time. So the effective DPS is way lower. That's what makes Flak so powerful. And there's the Strap Bomber. I was waiting for that. Strap Bombers more effectively deal with Flak than gunships do um, because they do their damage in one concentrated strike instead of having to hover over the top of the flak. Flak fires fairly slow projectiles, so not 100% of them hit the bomber. Wow, that was a lot of micro there. Um, but flak will eventually take down a strat. But here comes the strat. Aim right for this flak, I imagine. There it goes, and boom! A lot of anti-air goes down. Unfortunately, there are still many, many mobile flaks in the area. As long as he kites those restorers back, Genly is playing this perfectly. This is why you do not give up. If there's any chance of victory, because believe me, I, okay, admittedly, I might have given up at the point where both of my teammates were dead and I had two, and I had T1 units flooding my base out, but apparently gently saw a way and he has now taken the initiative in attacking. He's got a lot of combat units up and he's pushing his ACU back out towards the front. He's cleared 100 income again and pushing out 3.6K on the power end with that resource allocation on his ACU. So it's actually looking pretty good right now. Basically, all these guys are doing is feeding him reclaim. This is like a buffet right out in front. Oh my word. There comes the GC. There goes the GC. Here comes the GC. Mixing my metaphors. That is going to build very, very quickly with the amount of reclaim that he's going to be able to pull in here. He's got T1 engineers all over the place, reclaiming trees for power. He's pushing T3 land up here, pushing out a harbinger. So yeah, he is playing this exactly correctly. I think he's going to win it just because these guys are not pulling themselves together. Okay. Observations about the right hand team. We have a correct choice here. T3 land coming out. That is what you need to push as soon as possible. Once you get your enemy pushed into a quarter corner, um, when you see things, uh, ba -doo -ba -doo, one second, my bad guys had something minor happen. Jumping back in here. Um, if you see your opponent turtling up like this, you definitely want to shift to T3 mobile artillery as fast as you possibly can. Um, if you can do that, you can pretty much eliminate their ability to expand, and then you will be able to bombard their home base from the safety of the ledge, where things can't fire back at you because, hey, you've got an elevation drop, point defense can't hit. So that would be the ideal response to this. Also, air aggression, if possible. I do realize he's at T3 air, but T1 bomber spam does wonders. As we're watching here, gently, again, doing most of the right things, 
Um, dropping T1 bombers in, yes, they're kamikaze runs, but the damage is well worth it that he's doing. Look at the damage spread, the amount of units killed on that. So that is something good that could be done over here. And then also scouting. I have a feeling that this GC is half built and there's not been a single scout across. I would be correct um, because these guys do not have air factories even. Um, so yeah, scouting is critical and that actually goes back on gently as well because we have this isolated ACU out here with no protection. These five restores would be more than enough to kill that ACU all the way around in the back corner. So basically what we have here is a team waiting to die. The backbone was broken and no one picked up the air baton. They're just going to sit there and wait for death. <laughs> <laughs> if you're not scouting, that is essentially what you're doing, is you're waiting for death. You may not realize that you've given up, but when you're not scouting, you've given up. So restorers are going to move out again, just kind of picking around at the edges. The bombers come in, the anti-air goes to the back, the restorers move up and do some damage. The anti-air will move up and try to chase it, and then the whole cycle will repeat over and over again. It is perfect examples of harassment. Uh, GC is just about done here. We're at 80k on 99. So, yeah, 81, 83% complete or so. We're about to see that begin its march across the map. Now, there's enough loyalists here that I would be worried, except for the fact that the anti air is not pulling up. So, yeah, I think this game is clinched at this point. There is nothing they're going to be able to do to stop that GC. All right. GG. Couple of critical mistakes. I'm not going to label it a facepalm. It is not a facepalm. It is legitimate mistakes that were made and some other people that were doing some things right. So the takeaway from this game should be, well, this is definitely a learning experience. <laughs> <laughs> um, the takeaway from this should be, number one, don't ram your commander into a place that you have not thoroughly scouted and has lots of point defense, because you will die. That is all there is to it. You will die. And that is what Belated Cube found out. Also, if you have a distinct advantage over the other team, don't rage quit. Because, yeah, through a little perseverance and some careful micro, Gently was able to mop the floor with these guys. And then the third thing we need to learn is scouting. Look at that. As soon as the GC beam hit the first loyalist, Raptor Jesus is out. The rage is real on this one. <laughs> um, I, honestly, I don't blame him. Because after careful consideration, there is absolutely nothing that could be done in this situation. Yeah. Uh, so hopefully you guys can take something away from this game that is useful to you that you can apply to the other games that you are playing. Um, yeah, pick up this map. This actually looks like a really well-constructed map. It it might not tickle everyone's fancy. It might not be for you, but I would play it. I would definitely play it. The drop areas are unique. You have plenty of space to actually have combat between two, pl between two players on the same drop location, which is kind of unheard of. Usually you have a teeny tiny drop. You have bombers that may kill the engineer. They may not. And, yeah, everything's decided right there up front without any actual combat. So that's good, and the layout's pretty good, and I like the close proximities. Okay, that is the game. Not as bombastic as a lot of ones that we've had, but that was probably the most far gone I've ever seen anyone come back from in recent memory. I'm sure that I've seen something long ago, but that, I, I mean... He pretty much lost his entire base and all of his map control, except for this little corner right here, and all of his teammates. And he came back and won it. So kudos to him for that. Well done, Gently. Well done all around. Alrighty, guys. I'm going to wrap it up here. Don't forget, I have a live cast on Saturday, 6 p.m. Eastern United States time. We will be picking up a game, and hopefully my internet connection will not crash out again if it doesn't we will be playing a game together i will pick up as many players as i can into a lobby and we'll have at it and i will see you guys over there also hopefully the technical issues will be worked out by next week so i can get everything back on track like i normally do all right 
I think that's it. As always, guys, thank you so much for watching, and I will see you in the next cast.